Uh, as being in Korea is coming to an end, I just want to say thank you. And again, just thank you for this opportunity that you've given me to come out here and just, uh, just come up here and preach. Uh, just different opportunities of just doing different ministries here, and I'm very grateful for that. But yeah, uh, let's pray. Yeah, God, Lord, I just thank you for this, for this day. Again, I just want to continue to just thank you for the opportunity that you have given me, given all of us to just come out here and just do fellowship and listen to your word. Lord, I just pray that the things that I say won't be words of my own, but it'll be words of yours. Let it be your truth and only your truth. Yeah, God, I just want to say thank you again. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. So, if you guys don't mind, uh, the other day I heard uh, I heard this story, and I would like to share it. With you. So there was this father who had a son. He loved his son so much. He loved his son so much that every day after work, he would come, and his son would be so excited to see. Him. And the thing that would happen is. They would play, they would have fun, do father and son things. And this would happen every single night after work. <laughs> and of course, there's also a lot of other things that happen with love. There's the punishment and all that stuff, but that's a different story. <laughs> but So in America, we have this thing called bring your son or daughter to work day. And I don't know if you have it here. Um, but so this story is kind of based off America this man he was a man that worked as a bridge operator if you guys don't know what that is it's someone that as the boat is coming you operate the bridge it goes up and down and basically that's what it is making sure that people don't cross while uh, the boat is coming through the bridge and making sure the bridge uh, the, the boat goes through without hitting the bridge and this man, he brought his son to work. And so, during work, he was able to see pedestrians walking, he was able to keep an eye on his son, and at the same time, he was, a, he was able to keep an eye on the boats that were coming by. And from a distance, he saw this boat coming in. And he was making sure all the pedestrians were clearing out of the way so he could operate the bridge. And as the boat was coming closer and closer, he couldn't see his son. His son was playing around near the, in the, on the bridge, and eventually his son disappeared because his son fell through and kind of got, got stuck with the gears. So as the boat was coming closer and closer to the bridge, the father had to make a choice. Was it to, be, to save his son, his son that he loved so much, so dearly, or all the people that were on that boat. And as that time was coming closer and closer, as the boat was coming to the bridge, the man had to make a decision. And the man had to open up the bridge, let up the bridge, and let the boat pass through. And a lot of people on that boat don't know what happened that day. That this man sacrificed his son, his son that he loved so much, so dearly, for those people to be saved. And so for a lot of you, you may not necessarily know what's the whole point of this story. If you look at the story, this story was a partial illustration of the gospel. That God sent His one and only Son, the Son that He loved dearly, to die on the cross for us. After three days, rose from the dead, saved us, and all that. You know the gospel story. But that was an illustration of the gospel. And the thing is, since I've been here in Korea, there have been so many people coming up to me, giving me either tracks or um, advertisements for apartments, or people even came up to me wanting to share this story. So every time I go to the train station or I come out of the train station, there's always someone giving me an advertisement of this new apartment that's coming up. 
There's also that person that's on the street saying, hey, here's a little thing, here's a little pamphlet, here's a little paper, and majority of the time it says, if you don't believe in God, you're going to hell. And there's also times when people come up to me trying to witness to me saying, hey, did you know there's God the Father, but also God the Mother? And to me, their excitement for sharing this story, it may not be the truth, but they have this certain excitement for telling the truth or what they believe is the truth. And since I've been here, I've only been confronted by Jehovah Witnesses, people in cults, uh, people in cults, and as well as people advertising for a cafe or um, a new apartment complex. And I'm not saying that there aren't Christians out there doing evangelism. But since I've been here, the biggest thing that I've noticed, there's less people in the church doing it. More, There's a lot less people sharing the gospel than the people sharing this false truth. So if you will turn your Bibles with me to Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. Again, Matthew 28, 18 through 20. So in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, it says, And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. So, throughout the week, I've been thinking about what passage to share, especially with sharing the gospel. For some reason, this message has always been sticking with me throughout the week. And Pastor Miller and I, we went to Osanli, or Osanri, or however you say it, the prayer mountain here, where military men go and worship God and take time to pray and do all these different things. And this week, we were able to be involved with generals and lieutenants, and they're all ex-generals and ex-lieutenants that have retired from different countries. So we had some from Albania, some from Africa, different parts of Europe, things like that. And the biggest thing that they kept saying was Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And I think as a church, not necessarily just our church, but I think as a church, the body of Christ, that we lost this concept. In verse 18, you see that it says, And Jesus came up and spoke to them. You can see that Jesus was a very personal person. He, he wasn't speaking to them from a distance. It wasn't like me speaking to Ivy Emo all the way in the back. But he was actually close and personal to them. But the biggest thing was, because of verse, if you see in verse 17, it says, when he saw him, when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some were doubtful. He came up to them because of those people that were very doubtful. To show that it is him, that it is he, Jesus, after the resurrection. And then you can see in verse 18, and it continues to say that Jesus says, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. It was to conclude everything that he has been saying, everything that he has been preaching throughout the times before his death, were all true, that he has the authority, that he has the power, that he is the truth. And you can see that in verse 18, he reminds them, all authority has been given to me and in, in heaven and in earth. That Jesus was the mediator. He was the son of man. That God proved to the people that Jesus was always telling the truth after the resurrection. Let's continue on to verse 19. Uh, 19 through 20, the first half of 20, I guess you could say. Within these verses, 
There are six, five to six commands that you can see that Jesus has given his disciples. <coughs> what is the first one that you see? It says, go. Or you can say, go, therefore. And the biggest thing is, it doesn't say, if you go. He's saying, go. And what does that necessarily mean? What I kind of think it goes along with in Matthew 9, through, uh, verse 37 through 38, he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest and send out workers into his harvest. And what does that mean? Is that people, there's a lot of people in the world that don't know the gospel, that they haven't heard this story. And there's so many, so little people willing to share this story out of all the people compared to in the harvest. <clears throat> when it says go, it's not saying if you're a missionary, if you're a pastor, if you're called to go and do this. Every single one of us, we're all called to go. He's not just saying it to just certain people, but he's saying it to everyone. Go, therefore. That therefore is a reminder of all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. That therefore is that reminder and that it's part of the command saying, don't worry, I am with you. My strength, my power, my authority is with you. And then the second command, what do you see? It says, go and make disciples. So the definition of a disciple, or I guess you could say in my own context, a disciple isn't the person that just kind of just attends church. A disciple isn't someone that just says they believe in Christ. It's a disciple is the apprentice of Jesus. Someone that is willing to do the things that Jesus has commanded. Listen to him and follow him. And committing to him saying, I believe in Jesus. It's not that usual, well in America, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing here as well, but in America, there's those people that say they're Christians, but they only go on Easter, Christmas, Basically, those are usually the times that people say they, like, they're Christians, but they only go on like, Easter or on Christmas because they know those are important days. But a disciple is a person that's willing to go learn and live the life that Christ wanted to live. But the thing is, when you make a disciple, when you teach a disciple, I think you yourself have to know a lot of different information that you have to continue to be studying and living your life that Christ calls you to live. Making a disciple is not something that's going to take minutes. Making a disciple, teaching a disciple is going to be time consuming, I guess, I guess you could say. It's going to take years. It's going to take months. It's not going to just take 10 minutes and you're done. It's going to be something that is continuing. It's a process that can take forever. You can see in the next command it says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. He doesn't specifically say just a person to your left and to your right. Not saying those people are not included. But he says go and make disciples of all nations. The definition of all nations is the people in Seoul, the people in North Korea, the people in America, the people in South, uh, South America, Africa, Europe, China. And these are all people that, granted, all believe in different things, different religions, or they could even be people that don't believe in God. But that's the thing. We're supposed to go share the gospel, have if they come to Christ, if they decide to follow Christ, make them disciples. But that's the thing. When we when that command of all nations, I think some people always forget. It's not just the people that are around us, but it's the people everywhere. To go along with that, I think part, I had this conversation with one of my homes uh, that I met at Moody and you 
lives here now. Uh, we kind of had this conversation about North Korea. Uh, that the door is coming closer and closer to a point where South and North Korea could, maybe there could be a point where South Korea could go into North Korea. And that's the thing. We should be ready for that as well, that opportunity to pounce and go into North Korea to share the gospel, because they are part of all nations. And then you see the next command, it says, baptize them. When you baptize someone, the definition of baptism is to dip or to immerse, immersing them in water, uh, as we did for Haven's baptism. We immerse them in the water. And the thing is, with baptism, it's, it defines the death and the rise of resurrection. It's the old is going in the water, and the new is coming out. It's the sign of repentance. And the funny thing is, back in the day, when he would baptize, it wasn't something that was done in private. It was done so that everyone could see. Not to say that, oh yeah, yeah, like I'm a follower of God and like I'm bragging about that. No, it's because they didn't have a body of water like we could make now. They had to go into the rivers to do so. And I think it's funny because along this verse, a lot of people say that you have to be baptized to be saved. And for me, I don't think you have to be baptized to be saved, necessarily. But I'm not saying baptism isn't important. As a follower of Christ, I think you should be baptized. 